this series of What's God Like, the What's God Like series, um, and talking about the attributes of God, I think it's so important that this not be something that simply hit our bra- hits our brains, and therefore we get knowledge uh, about God, but instead that we begin to see God in the uniqueness of who he is, and we begin to interact with that. We begin to say, God, I now see you in this way of now opening my eyes fully to this attribute that is yours, that tells me who you really are, and not just my perception of you. And I'm going to interact with that, and that's going to change my life. And because it changes my life, it's going to change my world of influence. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but there's something happening in Washington, D.C. today. And uh, they have closed down the Roosevelt uh, Bridge because Captain America is being filmed. And it's a movie that's going to be coming out around the corner. And if some of you went routes where you would have seen closed off uh, roads, that's what's happening. Uh, Robert Redford, I don't know if he is, the, uh, is acting in it or if he's directing it, but he's connected to the movie, uh, Scarlett Johansson and Samuel L. Jackson, and another one that I don't remember the name of who's probably Captain America, because I, <laughs> I tend to doubt it's Redford anymore. But, um, but so, so if Scarlett Johansson walks in the service, just let me know. And... Um, <laughs> And so that's happening, Captain America. You know, when we were in Cabo uh, last week getting the beautiful tan that Lisa has and the halfway tan that I always get, um, we uh, were able to see, of all things in English, we were able to see Spider-Man. And it wasn't the more recent Spider-Man, which I don't fully understand why they filmed a more recent Spider-Man anyway, because the one with, uh, what's the name of the actor that was in the one before it? Thank you. Would, I thought Toby did a good job. And, uh, and, but um, I know all the girls scream for this latest one uh, that did Spider-Man. And, um, and so we watched that in English. And it was kind of cool, kind of creepy with the spider bite, but kind of cool and reminded me of my childhood of growing up with the comic books. And of course, the favorite of all time, and I know it's a favorite of Jeff's, is Superman. Superman uh, has, I don't know what his special power is. He's strong. He flies. Is there anything more to it than that? Um, And how it is that Lois Lane doesn't really get a sense um, for, you know, the fact that Clark Kent is Superman just because he's got glasses? I'm like, come on. It ought to be obvious. And then Batman and, you know, and and like I say, Spider-Man and all these with their superpowers. Um, Well, I want you to know all of that in the comic books is, is interesting. But there is some truth to this concept of someone that has power. And it's not uh, Superman and it's not Batman. And I think you know who I'm talking about. God is powerful. And when we look at the one who truly has all power being our God, we're looking at the attribute of God as being almighty. Now, this concept of being almighty, you know, uh, we're walking through a series. We've talked about how we perceive God is oftentimes either going to be liberating or going to be very confining as to how God moves in our lives. And sometimes we have absolutely false imagery of who God is. And for years and years, decades, you know, our parents, our grandparents may be able to uh, state that this is true, that growing up, oftentimes messages would be very, very hard about who God was. Uh, In the 1940s, 1950s, there may have been a God presented that uh, was a God looking to strike you down the moment that you did something wrong. And that has pervaded, uh, you know, and and moved into, in many ways, our generation as well. We think God's looking to harm us in some way. But when we truly understand the biblical God, it's so critical that we do, because then when we hear false reports of who God is, we're able to come up and say, wait, that's not who my God is. That's not who God, the God of the Bible is, and I'll show you why. And so that's important because atheists today are trying to present a God that is hateful and mean-spirited and petty and all of these types of things because they give a surface analysis of the scriptures and act as if that is the depth of the reality of the presentation of who God is, and it isn't. 
Uh, the Denver Zoo uh, had a, um, an exhibit that they were building years ago. And this exhibit was an exhibit for a polar bear. The polar bear had not arrived yet, but they knew that the polar bear was coming. They started the exhibit, uh, and, um, and they were wanting to build what would be the polar bear's natural environment. They were very excited about getting this, this bear. Well, the polar bear came a little late. The exhibit took longer than, it, than they expected. So they had the polar bear in a cage in which the polar bear walked three feet to each side. That's all the room the polar bear had. When the exhibit was opened at the San Diego Zoo, uh, the uh, polar bear was released into this beautiful, absolutely beautiful, expansive exhibit. Well, you can imagine what happened. The moment he got out of his cage, he walked three feet to one side and three feet to the other, back and forth, back and forth, not realizing the possibilities that were now there and what it was created to do, which was to be able to go beyond that cage that it was in and even beyond really the exhibit. So that being said, our perception of God can oftentimes get us into this very limited view of how God will move in our lives a very limited view of what God is willing to do for us, wants to do for us, how much he loves us, how much we're favored by him, how much he wants to bless your life and be able to make your life a blessing uh, to others. And today what I want to do, and I think it's so vital that we do this, today I want to glorify God and give him the glory that he is due. I want to present the true God to you today, the God of the Bible, who is all mighty, all-powerful, and fully able. Can I hear an amen? amen? Ephesians 3. Look at this scripture, and this gives us an idea of who God is. 20th verse and 21st verse. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Now, I want to stop right there for a moment because I've got a pretty big imagination. I can think of some pretty amazing things. But listen to this again. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in uh, Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul the Apostle knew the God who was more than enough. He knew the God who we are seeking to know, I believe, in our generation. And that God is the God who is almighty and all-powerful, who loves us, and we have a senior partner in our lives, and he has more power than anything you can muster up. And he's got more power than anything that can come against you. And no, nothing that is a weapon formed against you will prosper. Amen? Amen? God is omnipotent. Now, that's a big word, and it's a word that we would talk about in seminary. God is omnipotent, and basically in the Greek, it means all ruling. Omnipotent means all ruling, and it means almighty. The word almighty is uh, in the scripture some 345 times, and so it's something that I think is vital for us to understand. If it's important to put in the Bible 345 times, it's important to us to understand what does it mean that God is almighty? What does it mean that he's all-powerful? Now, when we say that God is able, what are we saying? He's able to do what? Well, here are some things. Number one, he's able to forgive. And we'll see that in Matthew 9, 6. And I'll go through this list rather quickly, but you can study these scriptures out later. He's able to forgive. Now, when we say that, that he's able to forgive, uh, we can just state that lightly. But I want you to understand what his forgiveness means. And some of you need to know this as a revelation this morning. God doesn't forgive the way man forgives. God doesn't forgive just what is for easily forgivable. And God doesn't forgive only to bring it up later and use it against you and hit you over the head with it. God's forgiveness is such that our sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west and buried in the deepest sea. Now, that's a, those are analogies used for us to understand that when we repent 
And when we come into relationship with Jesus Christ, then we can know that our sins are forgiven when we come to the throne and ask for forgiveness in genuine repentance. At that moment, we can know that the slate is wiped clean. Now, the power of that may not be known if all you did was forget to allow the lady to come through the door before you. That's not a grave sin. It might not be, you know, very respectable. You should let a lady come through. That's the way I was raised. You should hold a door, uh, you know, a door open. Amen is right. You should hold the chair, not because the woman is, the, is weaker in any way, but because you're honoring her. And, and I believe that's the right thing to do. But you'll probably get to heaven if you messed up on that this morning. But if you go through the prison system, as I have been into prisons, and I've been ministering there, and I remember walking in and hearing the stories of individuals who did things that would be unpardonable in man's view of things. Then you'll begin to understand what it is when they have Jesus right there in their eyes talking to you because they have repented and they've come to make Jesus as their savior and they're coming to God for forgiveness. And you can see completely a new individual by looking into their eyes. Now, God forgives. And whatever it is that you have done in your past or that you feel was done to you and now you feel stained, I want you to know God forgives, God cleanses and makes you new. The second thing is God saves. And when we look at the saving power of God, again, it's tied to forgiveness here, but God saves and God can save even that person in your family that you've given up on and that others don't even pray for anymore. And I want you to begin right now for a moment to pause and think of those that you know in your own family or that you work with, people that are in your world that are unsaved. They've never given their heart to Jesus Christ. They're not walking with God in relationship at this moment. And I want you to know that God saves. Now, don't, don't just know it. For just a moment, bow your head and just ask God to save that one that you're thinking of that is unsaved. And hold the Holy Spirit that we were singing about and talking about just a moment ago. This same Holy Spirit desires to bring that person to a place of conviction and to bring them into the kingdom of God. And so we're in partnership with God when we're praying for the unsaved. Amen? Third thing is, God delivers. He is able to deliver. And Daniel 3 is the whole story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I imagine they thought God's deliverance was a little bit last minute, but wasn't it awesome for the glory of God? They came out, you know, from the worst of fires. Uh, I'd like to think that, that, you know, in some way I'm related to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I wouldn't want to be related to the guy who got burned up trying to put him in. You know, but God delivers. And we can be confident that God delivers. Now, even that word can sound like an old-fashioned word, and you think, oh, deliverance. God delivers. What does that really mean? Until you're in bondage or you're held to something, I'll say it that way, that you don't feel you can shake yourself free from by your own power. And at that moment, that may be you this morning, at that moment that you say, God, you are my deliverer. I come to you as my deliverer. Deliver me now from these things that torment me. Deliver me now from this situation that I find myself in, from the attacks that are coming against me. Deliver me now in my thought life. Deliver me now in regard to this relationship. Whatever it may be, God is the deliverer that comes on the scene, and you can know that he is fully able to deliver you. You are not in an impossible situation with what you feel held to right now that you know doesn't please God, doesn't honor God, doesn't bring God joy. God is the God of deliverance for you in the now. And then the fourth thing, these two things kind of come together, and that is God protects and God rescues we see that in Psalm 79, 11. And really, these scriptures, there are so many scriptures that back up each one of these points, but it just gets you started here. So God protects and God rescues. And I want you to know God's here to protect and to rescue you. And even though we may feel that, well, that's not me. I don't need protection right now. You may be seated right in front of somebody that does or right near somebody that does. 
And that's where we as the family of God come together to say, God, will you touch anybody who's around me right now that needs your protection, that needs God to know that you are the rescuer? Will you move on their behalf right now? I want you to know in speaking to a group this size, I can be confident that there are individuals that at this very moment have come in here needing a touch from God and you must meet with God. And as a minister of the gospel, I know that when I step up and open the word of God. There's never a moment, and God taught me this years ago, there's never a moment where I will open up the Bible and speak from the Bible, but that the Bible uh, does not have the power to set people free, the power to heal people. This word of God is a two-edged sword. This word of God does not come back void. I stand upon the power of the word of God, not the power of my own ability. I could stand here as a mere man and give you nothing more than encouragement. But when I stand upon the word of God, I'm standing upon what others have stood upon for the last 2,000 years when we talk about the New Testament as well. And others, for longer than that, talking about the stories that were handed down in the Old Testament, standing upon the word of God to know that this God that we serve is almighty, all-powerful, and he is loving, and he cares for us. He wants to do this on our behalf. Now, the next thing is raise the dead. And even though I've never seen anybody raised from the dead, and I have heard missionary stories talking about things that are amazing towards that end, uh, even in more recent times. But I want you to know that for everyone that is in this room right now, that you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You have repented and given your heart and life to Jesus, your past, your present, your future. And you have said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And you have, with all sincerity, sought to honor him, walk with him, know God through a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is God himself. I want you to know every one of you will be raised from the dead. Every one of you will be raised from the dead. And even though that's not that big a reality to us right now, it's going to be a massive reality to you when we're high-fiving in the air kind of a thing, you know? <laughs> now, is there anything that God cannot do? Now, I don't really like the terminology that God cannot do anything. Maybe the better way to say it is there are certain things that God will not do. And the first thing is God cannot lie. God cannot lie. We see that in Titus 1, 2. It's very clear. God cannot lie. The second thing that we see, and by the way, that's just this, again, ethereal thought. Unless you recognize as you're reading through the word of God and you bring it down to, you know, uh, brass tacks here and right to our doorstep. And you say, God, I just read a promise from you and you cannot lie. God, I just read about your nature. I saw what you did in so-and-so's life in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, and you cannot lie. God, I know that you're trustworthy, and I know that I've met people who have lied. I've met people who have let me down. But God, you say you're always with me. You say you're forever with me, and you cannot lie. The second thing is God cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2.13. The third thing is that God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt any man. The Bible says, James 1.13. And by the way, these are not comprehensive lists. My hope is to get you to the point where you're just stirred up to get kind of excited about talking about this in your life groups or, or thinking about it in your private devotional time. And you start jumping in and doing further studies on these things because we only have so much time in a Sunday morning service to, to talk about the power of God. But the God is almighty. I believe that when we believe in God, that there won't be too many of us who say that God is not almighty. Now, there are some out there who say they believe in God and they limit God and whittle him down and put him in a box and all that. But for the most part, I believe I'm speaking to individuals who will say, Pastor, I agree with you. I get it. God is almighty. I understand. And there's nothing in that that I disagree with. But the big question is, what is our response to his being almighty? And I think that's the real powerful crux of this message is how do we respond to an almighty, all-powerful, fully able God? And when we consider that uh, and what our response is, I think of a story in the scriptures in the Old Testament. 
And it's a story of Israel being embattled on every side. I mean, there's just Israel's in this battle over here and in this battle over here. And of course, you're talking about the age old Philistines, you know, that are, are causing problems and different ones that are causing problems. There are battles that are happening. And what we're about to read in the scriptures is a story in which Satan is absolutely cunning in what he does. And I want you to catch this, lest we walk through life believing that our enemy is not after us and after us in a way in which he's very insidious and cunning. Because I believe that if we think that we have a stupid enemy, we'll not care about whether we're wearing the armor, we'll not think about whether or not we're truly submitted to God and speaking God's word over our lives. So it's not to scare anybody. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We know that our enemy is a defeated foe in the sense that he's going to be placed in the pit. We know his future. He does not win. We do in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. But it's important that we understand how insidious he is because there are moments in which the enemy attacks in ways we would not normally think of. Now, First Chronicles, we see a, a story, and in First Chronicles 21.1, the Bible says that Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Now, normally in reading that, I don't think that we would think much about that and we'd move on to the second verse, but I want to read it again. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Now, when we look at this, what we're seeing is that David numbered his troops. And he numbered his troops because he wanted to know if he had the power to win the battle. And he placed his hope in so doing in the arm of the flesh. He placed his hopes in the ability of his battalions to do the job. And no matter how much his general tried to talk him against it, tell him not to do it, to recognize that it dishonored God, David wanted it done anyway. And the repercussions were that 70,000 men of Israel would die because of this disobedience. I want to contrast this for just a moment. I want to contrast the fact that David did this against the David who is the shepherd boy that we see coming on the scene with his brothers, bringing bread. And when he comes, he sees Goliath and he takes off and runs towards the enemy with nothing but a slingshot and five stones. In which story of these two stories is David mightier? When he's running with the slingshot, when he hasn't counted all the battalions, when he's not counting over a million men to say, this is how I'm able to secure the victory and know that I'm strong. Believing fully in that God is powerful and able allows us to have less anxiety. If you truly and genuinely believe that God is able, you will not stress out about what you're stressing out about right now. It allows us to have less striving. Some of us are striving for things in the flesh because we want something to happen and it doesn't seem to be happening in our timing. And so we're striving uh, in the flesh. And, and uh, if somebody could bring me a water, it might be helpful. Um, it strengthens, strengthens our prayer lives. Oh, is it down here? Thank you, honey. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. It allows us to have stronger prayer lives. It allows us to have a deepened life of worship. If you believe that God is all powerful, you will worship the God who is able with one word to change the situations that you're facing. God is all, it changes the way that you worship. It makes the Bible come alive. Like I mentioned a moment ago, it causes you to read the Bible in such a way that you look for the promises of God. Uh, Dave Buring talked about looking for, you know, various things about the attributes of God. I would also encourage you to mark the promises of God. 
so that you can know what is your inheritance. Now let's look at Genesis, the 18th chapter. Let's turn there for just a moment. And uh, who would like to read 15 verses for me? You want to do that, Jeff? Okay, Jeff is just going to read 15 verses while I drink water. <laughs> let's give him some applause this morning. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you all may wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three says of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which, she, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Which makes us laugh. Um, thank you, Jeff. So let's look for just a moment at that second verse where we see the scriptures say, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. This is an early manifestation of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are some mysterious moments in scripture that we don't even fully understand. God appears to Moses, but he appears to Moses in a burning bush that is not that, that the bush is not consumed by the fire. It just continues to glow with fire. And that's kind of a mystery to us. Yet God does it and speaks to Moses that way. Or we see also in scripture with Jacob. Jacob wrestling in the tent with that mysterious one that comes. Sometimes it's called an angel. But we know these as uh, theophanies or Christophanies. And what those are, are God appearing directly to man in, uh, in the scriptures. And then specifically in the Old Testament, we talk about a Christophany. That's Jesus coming on the scene before he's born in Bethlehem. Remember that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were there, uh, you know, at the creation of the earth. And the universe, they are without beginning, meaning uh, they, you know, they have forever existed. And so what we see here is an early manifestation of the Trinity, which I kind of get excited about. I think that's kind of interesting there. Um, verse 10 says, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. This was a promise that was given to Abraham long ago. These were not words that would, you know, be brand new words to either Abraham or to Sarah. They knew that their descendants would be such that they could not be counted. So many, so numerous, they could not be counted. And yet we see the response. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the things that God has already spoken to our hearts. As we are in the midst of looking for a new word from God and we're looking for fresh manna words from God, I want you to know that God wants to see what are we doing with what he's already said. What are we doing with, with what's written in the Bible? 
What are we doing to respond to that? And we need to remember that God has spoken. And I want to ask you today, are there leadings of God that you have been led by God, you've been stirred by God, you know he spoke to you, that are now on the shelf and have been set aside? And it may be that it's been set aside because of the cares of life. And you've gotten to a point where you just say, well, so much has happened and so much water under the bridge. I don't really believe that God truly wants to use me anymore. I don't believe that God will bring others into the kingdom through me. I don't think my witness matters much, so I don't talk to people about God anymore. I remember when I was at a university, 90% of you can figure out what university that was, and I was at a university working there, and when I was working at the university on staff, there were those that had their dreams for me as to what I would do in life. And I had one that uh, came up to me and said, someday you'll be over this department of the university and you'll be, another one came up and said, oh, you'll be a vice president and you'll do this or that at the university. And, and we're going to, you know, bring you in to be a professor and then you'll do this and that and you'll come up the ladder in these ways within the university system. And when I heard those things, I looked at them and I felt nothing with what they said to me. I didn't get any sense that that was God speaking or that that resonated within my heart. It was their plans for my life. And after a while, I thought I was going to be at the university for the rest of my life. And I have friends that are still at the university and probably will be there for the rest of their lives in positions, you know, uh, there and that are vice presidents and other things. But when these plans were spoken over me and when I began to start to think that I was going to be there the rest of my life because maybe this is what's going to happen. And, and so, you know, and, and these are honorable things. Don't get me wrong. They're respectable things if it's your calling. But I didn't get a sense that it was my calling. And I began to relegate my dreams to my kids. I don't know if any of you know what I'm talking about. I began to think that maybe someday the things that God stirred in my heart when I was younger would happen through Aubrey Taylor and Sydney and not through me. I want you to know that if you're at a place where you begin to relegate the dreams of God that he's spoken to your heart and relegate them either away as in, well, I don't believe that's, you know, for me anymore. I think I've done certain things that have knocked that out and negated it or too much water under the bridge type of a thought. I want you to know that what God stirs up, he has a timing for. And this is a revelation for some of you. Listen to me when I say this. God's moving some of you into a season where he's about to manifest what he stirred in you years ago. Don't let it go. Don't give excuses to say that God's not able. Don't give excuses to say that because you're, you're in a certain stage of life and because you're a certain age and because you're a certain this or that, that God will not lo no longer do what he stirred within your heart that he would do. Now, I don't believe that we should mix up faith and presumption. Presumption is when we presume upon God our will and then say it's his will. I'm not talking about these things. I'm talking about when God speaks, when God stirs. And when God does that, and there are moments in which some of you know what I'm talking about, because at the end of a service, you'll feel that compulsion, that impulse to go forward at an altar call, or to say, that's me with what the pastor's speaking about, or during the worship, you say this song, it is just speaking my heart right now. That's the Holy Spirit stirring in you. I want you to understand who the Holy Spirit is and how he works. So when the Holy Spirit whispers something to you, you are obedient and you move upon it instantly. That's called obedience. And you may not be the best speaker and you may not be the best looking and you may not have the most money in the bank and maybe you have all those things, but I can tell you, it's not by your strength. And when you find yourself in a position where you're stirred by God, if you'll be obedient, even when you don't have any of those other things, I want you to know God will use you in ways that the best looking, most affluent, uh, biggest bank accounts are never used. Because God responds to an obedient heart. God's stirring somebody today. God's stirring somebody and when God stirs you to remember, and there's a statement there, remember. And when he stirs you, you want to respond to that. Amen?
And so we see uh, that there are moments in life where we need to be reminded that God is able. And Sarah began to believe in her life that, well, it'll be done. God spoke it, but maybe it'll be done a different way than God spoke it. Maybe it's going to be done through my concubine, Hagar. And that's how God is going to do all of this. And I'm rejected and I'm barren and I can't do this. And I was excited at one time that God could do this in me. But now I'm believing it's to another Abraham began to doubt as well. And in Genesis 15, we see in the um, second and third verses, the Bible says, but Abraham said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is uh, Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham and Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. So Abraham begins to say, it'll be through someone I've adopted because I no longer believe that you're able, God, or that you really choose to bless me in the way that you stirred my heart. In Genesis 16, we see uh, right after that, the first and second verses, the Bible says, now Sarai, uh, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. And so immediately what you see is they're beginning to say, God, I'm beginning to doubt your ability. I'm beginning to doubt that you're all powerful. I'm beginning to doubt that you can really do this thing or will do it. And therefore, I am setting up by my own strength the ability to make this happen. Never seek to conclude in the flesh what God began in the spirit. God has began a work, a good work in you. What God began, he will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. You can know that God began a good work in you. That God is in the midst of completing that good work in you. And even when it looks like it's dark, and even when it looks like, you know, you've just, their, their circumstances just say, oh, the odds are against this. I want you to know if God said it, you need to still believe in an almighty God, for God has a timing, and he is not dependent on man's timing. Amen. Now, Why did Sarah laugh? Could it be that Sarah laughed because Abram, as she, as she looked at him, was 99? I think that would cause me to laugh. <laughs> Could it be she laughed because she was 90? And she hears this one speaking, whether this is an angel, whether this is actually, you know, this theophany of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in a sense. Uh, you know, again, all of that is for theologians to figure all that out. Uh, I know that there are scriptures to, that some people challenge the idea that God is seen by any, has been seen in that way by any uh, person. Uh, but whatever this is, as a messenger from God, she begins to laugh. And did she laugh because she thought it was uh, too late? And I want to ask the question, is it too late for our nation to turn back to God? All of the headlines and the circumstances that we see show a trend of moving away from God, especially with the younger generation. Is it too late? Do the facts as we see them cause us to believe that God can no longer move as he's moved in generations past? We ought to know that our God is able, and if we as a people will get on our knees and humble ourselves and repent and pray and ask God to move in our nation, he will do what all of our circumstances say is sliding quickly in the other direction. God can do it. Is it too late for a loved one to be saved that you're thinking of? Is it too late for a colleague that you know of to come to a place where they're on fire for God and they're the opposite person than what you have been facing week by week. week. Is it too late for the lost? I want you to know God is able and it is not too late. And I want you to note something with this, this narrative that we've been reading in Genesis. She does not laugh out loud. Abraham doesn't hear her laugh. 
And this is what we have to realize is that matters of faith are matters of the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And we've gotten into a place where we've gotten so used to being uh, image conscious. We know how to look. We know how to look holy. We know how to look like everything's together. We know how to look like a church going good believer. We know how to look that way. And I want you to strip it away this morning. And I want you to be authentic before God because it's when we are weak that he shows himself strong. Paul shows us that insight that we'd never perhaps understand any other way because it's so opposite of how we would view things. But when we are weak, his power is strong. And that humility of weakness is the dependency upon God to say, I need you. It's not by my counting my battalions. It's by my knowing that it's not in my strength. It's not in my plans. It's not in my cunning and my ability. It is in your ability. And God, the greatest thing I could ever do is get close to your heart and worship you and know you not as a God that is whittled down, but as a God that is all mighty and fully able. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. Let's look at that in the scriptures. 2 Corinthians 12. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. This is so opposite of the world's way of thinking. In insults. I mean, when was the last time you delighted in an insult, idiot? Did you just delight in that? You know what I'm saying? That was a little off, but I wanted to stir you a little bit. <laughs> Therefore, I will uh, boast. I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may uh, rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. It's when that dependency is understood. As I study the power of God... It struck me how tragic, and I think this would be absolutely tragic, it would be to live a lifetime through and not know that God's power was available to you. I think of how many unclaimed miracles there are that are out there. And that God has a miracle, and sometimes that miracle is for you. And it's unclaimed because you don't see God as, as powerful as he really is and as loving as he really is to want to bless you. The idea that we can go through life and not fully experience God's presence and power when he desires with all his heart for us to experience that very thing. God wants you to know him. God wants you to know him not as this bellhop God or this sheriff from, you know, some western town God or this cosmic, you know, lightning bolt thrower and all these things, you know, that we try and think of God and, and consider him to be. God wants you to know him as to how he's revealed himself in the scriptures. We're meant to experience him. We're meant to interact with him. And I want to make a pact with you today. And this pact, as we close, uh, get ready to close here and as the team comes up, this pact is this understanding that we not only believe in God's existence. Now, listen to me for a second with this. That we will not only believe in God existing, for the demons believe that God exists, but that we will believe in an all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent God. And we will decide that now before we leave this room. Because if you will decide that within your heart, that this is the God that you serve and you will not limit him and he is almighty, he is all powerful, he is fully able, it will radically revolutionize your life if you interact and you play with that. That God desires to interact with us. That God desires to, uh, you know, I know a, a person uh, who's a friend of mine that talks about God messing with us. He desires to mess with you. He desires, in other words, to provoke you enough to go over to have that supernatural curiosity and go over to that burning bush. Go off the beaten path for a moment in the ruts and the routines of your life and say, I'm supernaturally curious right now, God. If you're almighty, what does that mean for me? 
and I am weak right now in these areas, and I need you right here. And I know men, sometimes it's hard to hear the word weak, and we just rebuff that, push that away. But I want you to know, men have trouble sometimes being authentic and vulnerable. And if you will not for a moment be vulnerable enough to say, God, I need you in this aspect of my life. In this part of my life right here, I am in desperate need of you. I cannot do it by my own strength. I don't have the wisdom enough, uh, but you are all wise. I don't have the ability, the power. You are all powerful. I need you. And before we leave here with this pact I'm talking about, it's that we would take seriously the words that were spoken to Abraham and to Sarah, that nothing is impossible with God. God. 